Daniela was like, hey, you know what really helps? If I can have an hour to myself at night, it'll really help our sex life. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We always strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy and positive approach to non-monogamy. However, everyone approaches this a little differently, and in its core, our show is about hearing and learning from different experiences and approaches people have. With that in mind, it's important to remember that the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily represent those of our own. It's also important to remember that we aren't doctors or therapists and that we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on this show. We should also let you know that this podcast will hopefully include some explicit language. So, if that kind of thing offends you, you should probably keep listening until it no longer does. If you're under 18, we'd suggest finding a different show or gather up your parents and listen as a family. Enjoy! Psst, Emma, are you there? <laughs> My job. Welcome to episode 39. Yay! We're you, Finn and Emma. Did you know three squared is nine? <sighs> Jesus. Okay. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. For anyway, that, what do we lesson. have today? We have episode 39 with some bloggers. Yeah, fight boring marriages. Yeah, Clayton and Danielle. So this is a really this is a pretty awesome interview. Yeah, it they was. they were uh well, you know what I'm not going to ruin it, but I will say this. They do talk about a 400-day streak of having sex. Yeah, pretty crazy, huh? And many other things from religious backgrounds to labels and discovery. So it's a kick-ass episode. You're going to want to listen beyond just us talking at the beginning, which is, I know why most of you are here. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) You just want to hear us ramble for a couple of minutes. Too many minutes. So... With that in mind, we will get you to that interview, but we had a couple of awesome updates. One is uh, we talk about the website Cassidy a bit, and we're going to just briefly say it's a website that you know we go to meet people, and it's probably our favorite one for meeting other like-minded swinger people, but we know it's not super popular on the East Coast yet, and we went to them and said, hey... We want to give our listeners more than just 30 days or 60 days if they leave us a review or whatever we were doing. And now, without anything other than using the links on our website, if you sign up, you get... Yay! Six months! Six free months of a full, full elite membership. Yeah, six months, people. That's exciting. Settle down. It's not that (laughs) exciting. (laughs) I think so. All right. Go over there, use those links. We also have some other exciting news about our other sort of affiliate, which is STD Chat. Hey, that was what I was going to talk about. Well, then talk about it. <laughs> yes. For those of you who listen to the show, you know that we plug STD Check often, and it is a service that we really believe in. It's an easy way to get checked checked and tested for STIs. If you use the link on our page, you get $10 off your panel. Every time. Every time you do it, yes. And? We have exciting news coming up, but we we can't can't release it yet. We can't quite talk about it yet. We're still finalizing the details, but it will be in the new year. Yes. 2019 is what she means. I think people know what that (laughs) means. All right. Enough talk. Let's go hear what Clayton and Danielle, how they're fighting these boring marriages. And before that, you can find us at our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, on Twitter under the screen name NNM Podcast, or the same screen name on Cassidy. And that's where you'll find the links to all the cool shit we just told you about. On our website, yes. All right, now we should go listen to what how they're fighting these marriages. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Enjoy. I feel like you you were just trying to, like cane me off the stage. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to get to the interview. All right, let's go. <laughs> so, well, thank, thank you both, uh, Clayton and Danielle, for, for taking the time to join us with your Friday evening. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I guess we'll, we'll jump right in. And you guys have a blog that's called Fight Boring Marriages. And, and normally we like to wait till the end of the, the podcast to like plug people's podcasts or blogs or whatever they're working on but i think for for you two since sort of the title of your blog indicates um not necessarily that you're non-monogamous but that you guys were maybe tired of having a boring marriage and did something about it so 
Do you mind talking yeah. a little bit about you know where the name came from and and sort of what was the the catalyst for you to start that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, so the name came about because the uh, site name was available. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <daddy. laughs> so we had about 10 things that were like, all right, if any of these are available, we'll go with it. But it did fit us really well, and we actually really do like the name. It kind of came about in a way of, you know, we feel like it's more of a choice, you know, to have an exciting marriage. And we just wanted to have a blog kind of showing that, that it's it's up to the two people. You know, you fall in love, it's exciting. And then it's usually choices that kind of bring you back out of that, um, whether or not they're just really small. And so we just wanted to kind of give a place where people could actually kind of write about their own. So we have guest articles, kind of what they're doing. But just, just talk about our experiences, just kind of give a quick snapshot and we wanted to highlight the good and the bad, you know, okay. and so give somebody a, a real view of what we're doing, you know, and if anything applies, great. If not, you know, great. <laughs> sure. I want to make mention that we're not therapists. We don't have any training and it's just our story. Like I'm not, you know, out to tell my friends stories. It's just about us. Yeah, just you guys doing awesome, fun stuff all the time. Yeah, some of your pictures are amazing. <laughs> all of your pictures are amazing. <laughs> so maybe two two follow up questions for for anyone that's not familiar with who you are. Do you mind briefly introducing yourselves? And then a follow on to that would be: Did you have like? Uh, did you get to a point where you felt your marriage was boring, and that you needed to do something to to combat that and sort of pull you out of that funk? I'll go first. So I am Danielle, and I, um, backstory on me, I am number 10 girl (laughs) in a family of 14, 14, uh, four brothers, and um, all from one vagina and one penis. (laughs) I know we live in Utah, but no, we are not polygamous. I unfortunately got that a lot growing up, but we grew up in a very conservative, very religious, um, I grew up in a religious household. We're in a very religious community. And for me as a woman in the religion that I, that I was raised in, my whole identity was waiting to get for like waiting for a man, like my parents. And I love my parents. I love my family, but it was always, oh, you don't have to go to college. You just go to college to find a man. <laughs> and then that's what I did. I met Clayton a month after I graduated high school, and we got married a year later, um, which is actually pretty crazy for Utah standards. They're normally married within a few months of meeting. Um, and with that, so many people don't, develop those communication skills. They don't know the person that they're dating. It's just, oh my gosh, I like this girl. I have to get married and I want to have sex because sex is a very taboo subject in our community. Um, And maybe to specify, do you mind? I mean, I think it's fairly obvious at this point, the the religion or the community that you're referring to. Yes. So we um, both grew up LDS, that's Mormons. Um, They recently changed what we can call them. So I don't even know at this point. Um, So we um, announced to both our families three years ago that we no longer wanted, we're going to to be going to the Mormon church anymore. And we've been transitioning out for the past eight years. Uh, Now my parents don't know, but we did officially resign a year and a half ago. So we just really want Mormonism just kind of out of our lives. With that being said, we were devout for 30 years. And so it is our life. It's our backstory. We're still in this community. We're raising our kids around this community. Um, so unfortunately it's there and we talk about it, even though I cringe every time we do. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and to give you my backstory. So I, you know, also grew up in a Mormon household, very conservative, but as far as Mormonism goes, though, we have no problems with Mormonism. 
we uh, and we get into a little bit more, but kind of part of the site too is how we got raised um, being taught about sex. And those are kind of the, the reasons we bring up Mormonism at all. That has nothing to do with, we actually like a lot of the teachings and still have, you know, you know, I, I mean, it wasn't all a bad experience by any means, but the sexual side of Mormonism is not, it, 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 it's very strict. You don't do it. It's, you know, between a man and a woman, you know, when I started at 12 years old, every six months, I'd get asked if I got mas if I masturbate by an ecclesiastical leader. So every six months, I had to tell him, I had to lie to him and say, <laughs> no, I don't do this. Or, and if I did tell the truth, I mean, and so you come, you know, we got married really young and our sex life was really good. But then pretty soon, Danielle really disconnected from it. And I didn't understand it as a guy. I'm like, well, this is awesome. Like, we can have sex all we want. This is what we've always wanted. This is half the reason we got married. And, <laughs> and she's kind of disconnecting from it because it's still a taboo thing. She really doesn't know how to have that in her, her life. She's been told her whole life, you don't do this, you don't do this, it's evil. The only thing you can do worse is murder. So don't do it. And, uh, and so it really messed with our sex life I, after probably year two. Yeah. <laughs> and so well, it, and it was kind of a battle to figure out how to gain a sex life after that child, like, you know, right. yeah. something between the spouses. Yeah. Out of curiosity, how much sex education did you guys receive? Was it just that it was wrong and that was it? Like nothing else about it? Or did you receive a little bit more? So, the guy, no, you, I mean, it's just don't do it. Yeah, there I can is... answer that one. Um, as a girl growing up in the Mormon church, just like Clayton, I would, you know, at 12 is when you get interviewed by your ecclesiastical leader. I would go in a closed, locked room with one older man and ask questions that I didn't even know. Like, I'm 12 and he's asking me, do you masturbate? And I'm deer in the headlights. I don't even know what that means. So, no. <laughs> um, and then, like, my first sexual experience, I was, I wrote about it on our blog, but um, I was 14 and I had my first kiss. Happened to be a French kiss. A boy kissed me during, like, a junior high assembly. And I felt so much shame and guilt about it that I went to my ecclesiastical leader you know, and confessed my sin that, oh, you know, I, I got French kissed, even though I was not in the wrong at all. And he gave me a punishment. And so I was publicly shamed in front of my parents, in front of my friends, in front of my entire, we call him a ward, which is my neighborhood, because I was 14 and a boy kissed me. <laughs> you know, that, wow. Yeah. And <laughs> the lessons we would get would be, so there are so many stories, and I wrote about it on my blog, a lot of examples. Um, but the one that sticks out in my mind is the teacher would bring in cupcakes, you know, gourmet cupcakes, decorated, they're gorgeous. She says, well, who wants a cupcake? And, you know, every, every hand goes up. Well, I do. That's, you know, it's a good-looking cupcake. And then she licks it. She says, who wants it now? And of course, nobody, nobody says they want it. And she's like, <laughs> <laughs> except for Finn. <laughs> yeah. And she would liken that as if you as a girl allow, you know, boys to touch you or, you know, anything, then you're like the lip cupcake, which leads, because girls were taught, girls are the brakes, boys are the gas. So if anything happens or goes too far, it's the woman's fault. That's in any sexual situation, including rape in right. the culture, wow. unfortunately. Wow. And uh, they view it as a sin next to murder. So when Clayton and I got together, and like I said, we had dated for one year because Clayton was stubborn and didn't want to be the cliche, you know, come straight off his mission and get married. 
Um, so we did end up having sex before marriage, which is a huge no, no it's sin next to murder. So we would go to our ecclesiastical leader and we would confess and be punished and publicly shamed. And of course we love each other and it keeps happening. (laughs) And so our leader finally said, break up or get married. And so we, you know, decided, okay, we'll get married, which I got married a month after I turned 19. (laughs) Wow. And when we told my parents, hey, we're getting married, and my mother says, oh, what temple are you getting married in? And I say, well, none. (laughs) It's the first time Clayton has ever heard my mom swear. (laughs) She said, damn it. (laughs) So, but, yeah, so I think to kind of bring everything back around to kind of your question was, So when we got into our marriage, we were both naive on anything that had to do with sex, a healthy sex life, never had healthy education. And there's really no one to talk to about it because your friends are in the same boat. Your neighbors are in the same boat. I mean, there's so, I mean, yeah, you can go to online and, you know, where an 18 year old, 19 year old, 20 year old boy is going to go online probably isn't going to be the best. Yeah, right. not uh, necessarily the most educational. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the best advice anyway. So so we end up in this marriage, and we're young, and we're kind of, and it's really exciting at first, obviously, um, you know, because this is the first it. time. It's just like, okay, go. Now you can have all the sex you want. You know, it was like we were finally released, and we did. We had a ton of sex. <laughs> but um, Danielle quick- started... Oh, sorry. I had yeah. a quick question uh, to butt in. Did had you been taught like at least about birth control? Because had yeah, yeah, um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> no, you, you. No, well, we're not going back a hundred years. Yes, absolutely. I, yeah. we I knew about birth control, but I she had was, to take myself to. I went to Planned Parenthood, and yeah. that's where yeah I learned. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I didn't we, have a mom or sisters and I had nine my friend helped didn't they (laughs) (laughs) tell me (laughs) yeah yeah so so we were on birth control when we were dating using contraceptives and stuff when we were having sex so that that was that part was there but you're never kind of really given those lessons you kind of have to figure them out on your own yeah because abstinence is the only thing they that's what you're taught it's just education we have on it sure yeah sure so, so anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt your, what you're saying. Oh, no, you're, no, you're <laughs> fine. And so, yeah, so a few years into the marriage, you know, we're really kind of really still learning who each other are. You know, yeah. you know, we had a pretty quick dating, really, even though it was a year, we were still really young. And so we, we just started kind of figuring everything out. And, you know, there were times when, you know, when we were dating, blowjobs were fine. But two years into the marriage, she's like, you know. My sisters say they don't give those, and, and I don't know how much I want to be giving those anymore. And I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> <laughs> I don't like this at all, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, it started just it just started kind of falling apart. And then, of course, we started. Then we got pregnant and had a baby, and so the focus was on the baby. And yeah, that doesn't add then, any stress at all, right? <laughs> No, no. And especially, you know, it's now the, you know, your sex life is going to change again. And then afterwards, sex at that point, at least in Danielle's eyes, started becoming like, well, I want to have more babies. And so that was kind of when I was, we were the most sexually active when she wanted another baby. But we had a hard time with pregnancies and miscarriages. And so that really threw sex really off so now at this point you know there's the background from becoming the religious background there's the children there's the miscarriages and we finally have another boy and you know so we go repeat the whole cycle again and he was really difficult in the sense that danielle never thought because of the miscarriages she never really felt like she 
I was didn't bonded want... with the child that well because she always felt like he was just going to pass away. Yeah. And so, so then we go through that, and now we get spit out, you know, seven, eight years later, and I had graduated from college, been doing the work thing, and that's kind of where, you know, the marriage could have gone either direction, I think, at right. that point. So, back, real quick, just out of curiosity, so it's you, you mentioned early on that Danielle started to sort of pull back and not really want some, not not want sex as much as when you first started yeah. dating and when you were first got married. I'm I'm just curious, and 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 it's kind of a personal question, but hey, that's that's what the podcast is about, right? <laughs> yeah, so. like all our questions are pretty personal. <laughs> but um, I guess it was it was it. An emotional, like you felt shame and guilt, uh, you know, left over from the religion side, or was it like neither of you had really learned each other's bodies and how how to have sex in a way that it felt good, and so it just wasn't that enjoyable. Yeah, I think a, a little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at, at this point, we were really in the church. We were very religious, doing everything, you know, crossing our T's dotting our eyes. But for me, I had been told my whole life that sex is a sin. No, 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 no. And then magically I get married and it's now I have to provide my husband as like a sex buffet, like whatever he wants, whenever he wants it, I have to provide. And it was really hard for my brain to make that switch that way. Now it's okay. Um, and then on top of that, um, I was having some health issues that I didn't know I had endometriosis that was diagnosed after we got married. And so sex in itself was extremely painful. So kind of throwing those two things on, put a damper on things. Um, we did. Well, and when we dated, she was the aggressor. <laughs> like I was like, holy crap. Like she's throwing my hand down her pants. She's taking her the clothes off. Like, she led, I mean, she held my hand down the entire sexual gamut of <laughs> rounding the bases. <laughs> and so this is the person I'm marrying, you know, this, like, this person that can't keep their hands off me, that keeps making, I felt like, not making me, but <laughs> providing me with the opportunities <laughs> to sin. And then, <laughs> and, and, then one, and then one day she's all of a sudden pumping the brakes and saying, well, hold I'm not that into it. I mean, that that's a big, that's a big flip. Right? Yeah. It, it was. And it was like, whoa, wait a minute. What happened to that girl that would try to give me blowjobs and, you know, uh, driving my car on the freeway, you know, like <laughs> when we're dating and then, you know, and then it's just kind of cold, but there was a lot of, there was a lot of circumstances. It wasn't just one thing. I mean, like she said, endometriosis, babies, miscarriages. I mean, I was going to school, you know, we had uh, loved ones pass away. You know, there was finding a job, you know, and when I did find a job, I was working crazy hours, you know, at first. And so it was just the gamut of everything. And, and you know, we really don't find our early part of our marriage that unique to us. I mean, I think there's a lot of people that go through the sexual frustrations, you know, whether or not they were in religion, in college, careers. So I don't think we were, were this abnormal couple. And so as we kind of came out through our 20s, you know, we were like, God, we have never been anywhere. We have never, we don't do anything, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so we were like, we should go do stuff. And we really, Utah has so much crazy cool stuff that people travel all the, over the world to see, and we've never seen it. So, you know, we just started staying local and kind of doing these things and, uh, and just it, going on dates again and uh, really just kind of putting a lot of effort back into each other. And that's kind of where that, whole now come back around to fight boring marriages it's kind of when we made that turn of going hey we, we can do better <laughs> you know we don't have to live our lives like this anymore you know let's let's start having fun mm -hmm. and and that's kind of where the block really starts is 
you know, kind of more those decisions we made to kind of change from that just mundane come home and go back to work kind of life, yeah. you know, yeah. you make that <laughs> yeah. conscious choice to put a lot more effort into your relationship. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I remember, you know, we, we had talks early on and Danielle was like, Hey, hey you know, it really helps if I can have an hour to myself at night, it'll really help our sex life. And I'm like, okay. (laughs) And so like one of the early things we did was like, it'd be like eight o'clock and I'd be like, all right, I'll get the kids down and, you know, do some dishes and then kind of come in and she'd be in reading her book and stuff. And like the sex was amazing. And so we're like, I'm like, Oh, okay. This is, this is one step. You know, she, with, with having a really young children, she's like, I just need, a moment to turn into from a mom back into a wife, you know, back into somebody who's sexual. And it's like, I get that. So, you know, we started making kind of small decisions to kind of really start bringing that, you know, making the sex life important. Right. And so, and so was the, the conscious effort to start going out and doing things, you know, you said going on dates, going and exploring your home state, at least to start with, were those, you know, it, it, I think it's it's fascinating that those were ways that you sort of rekindled your sex life by not necessarily focusing on the sex part of it, but but focusing on the the rest of the relationship as a whole and letting letting the sex follow that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I definitely was quick to recognize when Clayton was making an extra effort for me. And so I would reward him with that in the bedroom. You know, like, oh, sweet, you did the dishes for me? Well, let me give you a blowjob. Dishes equal blowjobs? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I can do this. I can handle this, yeah. Hey, hey kids, can you make some more dishes? (laughs) Where are the damn dishes? (laughs) so I'm curious, was there ever a, was there a point where it flipped in, in your brain, Danielle, rather than feeling like sex and, and sex related acts were things that you were that you owed Clayton and became something that you were desiring yourself and that you wanted to do because you wanted to do them, not because you felt like you should be doing them? Yeah, there was. Um, I went on a retreat with my sister and it, and her friends. And it was the first time in my marriage that I heard other women talking openly about sex. Wow. <laughs> and it was oh, probably five years into the marriage. And um, they were raving about this book, The 100 Days. I can't think of the name of the book. Um, Just Do It. Sorry, it's the name of the book. And the whole premise of that book was him and his wife um, decided to have sex for 100 days in a row. And so I came back from that retreat and I, and my sister gave me her book and I said, Clayton, we're going to do this a hundred days. It's going to work. And he was skeptical. And I was like, what? This, this is sex. Like you don't want a hundred days of sex with me. <laughs> um, and we lasted the first time we attempted, we lasted about two and a half weeks. It didn't go well. <laughs> um, and then later that year, we try, kind of went on a sex streak and the streak lasted for 400 days. Wow. And we, we actually have a calendar of all the things we did on those days. Like if I gave him a blow job or if we did something new that we'd never have done before or if we did something, you know, special that we do only once in a while, like anal or, you know, something crazy. So I, I still have that calendar and we made little, you know, names, code names for everything. Uh-huh. Um, but through that process, I found that I wanted sex. I was craving sex. It wasn't just a thing to do to make my husband happy. It was something that I needed and it's kind of a running joke now. If we go too many days without having sex, I'll turn to Clayton and I'll say, Hey, you need to fuck me now or else we're getting a divorce. <laughs> so. 
And so what were some of the things, I guess, maybe that along that route, like at what point did it sort of trigger in your brain? Like, Oh, this is, this is enjoyable for me. This is, this is what I wanted out of sex versus maybe what, what it was before that was causing it to feel like a chore. Well, I think one of the things that kind of with that 400 days is, you know, you kind of start learning. We were prepping for it and stuff. So, you know, we were making it fun. You know, we were, it wasn't just 400 days in the bedroom, you know, it was like, Hey, we should, we should go do it here. We should go on a date, you know, let's go find a park. Let's, yeah. You know, and so we were like doing you put fun a lot things more effort there, into it. Yeah. There was a lot of effort into it to make it fun, but there were days where honestly, like we'd look at each other and it's like, Oh, <laughs> all right. All right. You sure? <laughs> Danielle was big on like, yes, we are getting this goal. Like you are getting in me at some point. And I'm like, all right, I can do this. And so it would start really lackluster. I mean, really almost forced just to keep the the number going and it would end amazing. And I was like, holy cow, I feel better, you know? And so it just really kind of emphasized how important that, that pillar is in our relationship. It, it really was one of the things that made me fall in love with Danielle was how sexual she was. And to get her back after so many years was like, it was just crazy, but it wasn't like she just showed up. It was, you know, a lot of effort, <laughs> a lot yeah. of work, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so, so. All, along those same times, you guys were out, Hike. And I mean, if, if people go to your blog and look, I mean, you guys go all over the world, you're hiking, you're out in nature. I mean, you have beautiful photos. And mm-hmm. so yeah. I, I definitely encourage people to go check that out because the pictures are amazing and the, the stuff you two do together is amazing. And so did did the, the 400 days of sex like also inspire new outside of the bedroom adventures? Uh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I think the biggest one that that kind of started was kind of being nude in the outdoors. You know, we'd climb a mountain and, you know, she would first just take a topless picture. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is the coolest thing ever, you know? And And I was the driving force behind that. I just thought it would be hilarious to Clayton's on top of the mountain, you know, taking pictures of something else and he turned around and I had my top off and we'd have a good laugh about it. And then it kind of became a tradition. Every time we made our goal, we hit the top of the mountain. I would have a flashing picture. (laughs) So, so yeah, so we ended up really exploring nudity in a way, kind of getting used to being naked again. Uh, Well, never really had never experienced any of that. So I shouldn't say again, but I think that was kind of one of the big things with with all that initial hiking and stuff was just being alone together. And, you know, we would have sex on top of mountains. And so then we were trying to figure out where else we have sex. that's really fun. You know, we should go down by the lake. We should go find a beach, you know, and we should go swim naked. And all these things were just really exciting, you know? And, And, and as you guys know, when you discover something kind of new, it, it recharges you for a long time. You know, yeah. it's, it, it boosts your, your relationship for a long time. <laughs> so, so yeah. yeah, we were just really having fun with that. So, um, I think that's kind of the biggest thing out of that 400. I'm kind of starting to explore the shadows of sexuality a little bit. Yeah. Was there, was there something, maybe each one of you that that you discovered was like your favorite thing to do. And that sort of like kind of stuck with you that you, maybe you didn't even know existed before the 400 days started. I don't don't know if there was anything I didn't know existed, but I can tell you there were a lot of things I wanted to try and it gave it, gave us open communication to be able to talk about those things. So we would, we, we had a, a travel bucket list and we had a Utah one, we had a US one and we had a world one. And we wrote out all the things we want to see in Utah, all the things we want to see in America. 
that were, you know, top tens or whatever, and then where we would want to go in the world. And I was like, we should do a sex one. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Danielle was like, okay, that sounds fun. And so we sit down and we write this list out of all these bucket list items. So now we it opened up that communication to be able to kind of feel safe to talk about you know, some fantasies, maybe some stuff we've never talked about. And one of the things my friend told me he did once, he's like, we had sex next to another couple. And I'm like, what? People do that? I'm like, well, that sounds fun. But I never really brought it up to Danielle. And and I thought, okay, we decided we'd go every other one. So I'd get the odd numbers and she'd get the even numbers and we'd go to 10. <laughs> And I said, on my last one, I'm going to write that, you know, unless she comes up with it first on her own was what was in my my head. first one. (laughs) And out of nowhere, she's like, I want to have sex next to another couple. And I'm like, whoa, okay, (laughs) you know. So it's like we don't know how to go about doing this, but like, you know, just having that ability to express that to each other in a safe environment was new and it was amazing to have that safe space to where you could talk to your the person that you love the most about your sexual fantasies you know and that was new to us it wasn't something we were used to doing so right so we're definitely going to come back to that because obviously the name of the podcast but I'm I'm really curious. Was there anything that either one of you wrote down that the other person was like, absolutely, hell no, not doing that? No. 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 Danielle isn't always the best with uh, a certain bodily fluid of mine being anywhere. Cum. I hate cum. <laughs> I don't want it by my face. Anywhere neck down, I've got full... <laughs> <laughs> I can shoot away. And so some of those I was like, what if I went on your face? And she's just like, oh, we have to. I'm like, yeah, maybe, no. maybe for your birthday. <laughs> yeah. Maybe for Christmas. Yeah, maybe we'll, I'll save that one for you. I'm like, okay. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, but, but it wasn't anything like major that was on there, you know, just more just a comfort thing like, like that. Sure. So, I think that's a really fascinating idea too, like to have the bucket list for for things you want to do together that are outside of sex that are also a sexual to do like bucket yeah. list. I think that's a really good advice for couples to try to do that together because you get to learn about different things, sexual yeah. and non sexual, that you want to do together. Yeah, yeah. I mean it was just doing the list was fun. I mean just to to be able to like I said, just be able to have that open communication was just awesome, you know, and I, and we discovered stuff about each other on that. I mean, at that point, we'd probably been married eight, nine, 10 years, somewhere in there. I don't know, but a long time before this was something that we were able to even communicate to each other, you know, and feel safe about it. So Mm -hmm. has, has every item on the list been accomplished at this point? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Several times. (laughs) <laughs> so maybe now would be a good time to revisit the um having sex next to another couple yeah and, and and maybe leading into that so one of the things that people would would find um in the a word that you guys have used a few times on your website is the word monogamish and maybe explaining to people what that word means to the two of you and 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 maybe how you went about uh, discovering that and what, what that looked like. Well, um, I'll let Danielle answer the, uh, uh, or give the story on the, um, the, uh, first time we had sex next to somebody (laughs) and then I'll, and then I'll touch base on that, uh, monogamish. So on our bucket list, that was what I had, had written down and we, um, went on a hike, a midnight hike with, um, the assumption that there will be naked people up at these hot springs. And we got up there and there was another couple who were naked in the hot pot next to us. Um, we invited them over to ours and the girl, 
after some talking, said, hey, do you mind if I kiss you? And I was like, well, I never had this opportunity before. I've never been asked before. And a threesome would probably be pretty hot for, you know, for Clayton. So we kissed and I found I'm not um, loving the ladies. It's not for me, unfortunately. And Clayton also found that it wasn't very fun for him not being involved. <laughs> I mean, at this point, we've been married a long time. And she's kissing somebody, and I'm not. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, this is fine and all watching, but I would like to, <laughs> like, where, when do I get to kiss somebody? So I get came kind of more down to that, you know, just that early initial just dumb jealousy that is going to happen. Right, mm-hmm. right, feeling feeling left out. Yeah. So with that couple, they were camping nearby the hike, and we ended up going to their tent, and we did have sex next to them. Well, and I should mention, like, we're sitting in this hot spring, you know, and I'm just cool. Like, this is one of the first conversations I've ever had with another couple, and everybody's naked. And so this is this the first is... time we were naked in public. Yeah, so this is already a big <laughs> deal. And we're sitting there and we're just having a fun time. These people are awesome. All a good experience. And then Danielle out of nowhere goes, hey, I have a bucket list item. Do you want to help us? And they're like, <laughs> what is it? And she's like, we want to have sex next to somebody. Do you guys want to be that people? Do you guys want to be those people? And they're like, okay. And I'm <laughs> like, so I'm sitting in this corner of this hot spring going like, whoa, whoa like, <laughs> holy cow like, this is I mean we went up to just experience being naked in hot springs possibly around other people and literally a, an hour later we're walking to a tent with another couple <laughs> <laughs> so, so your first your first experience having sex next to another couple was in a tent was in a tent on the side of a mountain with these people we had just met an hour or two earlier <laughs> and yeah it was uh so in your i don't know if it was in your first or second one but you talked about the uh, power your brain has over your penis uh-huh that was my first experience <laughs> on how <laughs> uh, i didn't know that could happen so uh but i am a fantastic actress <laughs> yeah so no one knew <laughs> we were having so, yeah, so uh, I gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we go in there, things aren't working like they should work. Danielle plays it off really well, and you know, we we literally just end up going, Okay, um, see you later. <laughs> um, Zip. unzip the tent. And, and, were, and they set the stipulation, they were like, You you guys don't want to touch us, do you? And we said, No. And we said, okay. So we already had boundaries that there was going to be no touching, and there really wasn't. It was just 30 minutes in a tent, and I don't know their names. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> pick them out of the lineup. <laughs> and that was that first experience. So walking back was, it's about a three-mile walk from their camp. So we had about three miles to just talk oh, about wow. what happened. Like, okay, where do we go from here? What the (laughs) heck just happened? I mean, um, but we got home about four or five in the morning, showered off and had amazing sex and things worked that time. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Pissed you off. Pisses me off even worse. How well they work an hour later, (laughs) but anyway, that's a different story. Oh yeah. That's pretty standard. Pretty standard. (laughs) Yeah. So <laughs> that's a that's a really awesome story. Though. Yeah. No, I think that's that's amazing. Um. So yeah. Was it a catalyst for? I guess the conversation on your way home was it like that was awesome. That's something we want to do more of. We wanted maybe take it further, or were you like, hey, one and done. We're we're happy with with the the way things went. Which I, it sounds like obviously you weren't necessarily thrilled, but yeah. Uh, uh, one and done was the initial, Hey, we did it. We get to cross that off that number 10. We're 
that kind of people where we have a list or a goal and <laughs> we do we really are those type of people that just maybe competitive or something and we got it crossed off and it was like all right move on to the next thing <laughs> move on to yeah. the next thing so the next thing that would kind of fall you know kind of under that maybe non-monogamy blanket um was we i i started going you know that hot springs thing was really fun hanging out with people naked. And I saw this video of these friends in uh, Lake Powell and they had rented this houseboat and they were all topless. All the girls were topless and they were kayaking and swimming and just having this awesome time. They were, had big bonfires. And I was like, God, people have friends like that. <laughs> where, do, <laughs> where do we find friends like that? So, the next kind of big step for us was probably looking for what we call naked friends Mm -hmm. Um, where, you know, we were like, how crazy would it be to have a friend that you could be like that? You know, how, how could you be around them like that? And so because up until this point, most of your friends you had all met through religion, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, you know, the only friends we had that were outside of religion were the ones that had left. Okay. Um, I had no friends. To be honest, I had no one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Danielle didn't have a uh, Danielle didn't have a very strong friend base at that point. That was kind of our next big thing was to to find friends that we could be naked around, and that was really just the goal. And but I mean. What do you do to find those people? Like I said, it, it, it's a, we didn't know. And so I was like, Craigslist? <laughs> <laughs> and then, no, we can't do Craigslist. I'm like, well, where else do you find friends? Like, we, you know, we weren't going to bars at that point. I mean, we're. <laughs> I don't, you're just barely drinking. I had my first drink at 28. Yeah. Second I get drink at 29. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, so so we we didn't know where to find these naked friends. So we placed this ad, and within a couple of days, we had some people answer us and on Craigslist. On Craigslist, <laughs> and they were awesome. They were the such cool people. Like we got along with them so well. So we met them. We hung out um, naked, and we got a little handsy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and we're still friends with these people. It's been, I don't know, I think four years now. And we talk to these people almost every day. Uh, They're some of our best friends. And we've kind of discovered, so we set out to have naked friends of people who'd be naked. But we found every friend that we have that's naked around us, that's a naked friend, are the friends we can be the most emotionally naked with. Mm -hmm. So we find that for some reason removing your clothes in front of somebody breaks down so many other barriers. It, it's really an amazing thing. It's we tell everybody, you got to have naked friends. Mm-hmm. You got to get a naked friend. I'm telling you. Man. Naked physically <laughs> and emotionally. Yeah. Right. So right. And I'm not, I think we, we can completely relate to that. that. And so, and so you, you mentioned that you got a little bit handsy. Were, were the interactions with these people and were these friends, like, were the were the other people swingers? Had they experienced non-monogamy themselves or was this their first foray into it? And and maybe did you guys explore beyond just being naked together? Uh, it was also their first experience. We, like I said, just got handsy. We didn't do more than that, but. I did learn something new about myself. I can squirt. That was amazing. (laughs) Sounds like you were pretty handsy. Yeah, that's a fun, that's a fun discovery. (laughs) Yeah, we got, our hands were all over the place. And it was funny, it actually came back to, we went on a camping trip with them and we were all just kind of hanging out and, and I was like, hey, do you guys want to have sex in the same room? And they're like, okay. Because for me, I was looking for redemption. (laughs) It had been a couple of years and I'm like, okay, let's see if this can really happen. And um, this time, I think because 
because we already built a pretty good relationship with them. You know, we'd already text a little bit back and forth and, you know, there was nothing new being seen that uh, it just made the whole thing easy. And I think we were, that's, we were relaxed enough that, you know, we were, you know, able to kind of, Danielle said, just get a little bit of, get a little handsy with each other. So, but we already had a pretty good level of comfort with them before any of that. Right. Right. Now, so one thing you mentioned, Clayton, before we before we started recording, was that one of the things that you you learn being brought up in the in religion was that Danielle's sort of body and sexuality and and, and it sounds like more or less everything about her was sort of your property in a sense. Is that was that sort of how you described it? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely this like kind of patriarchal type. I don't know if dominance is the right word, but where, you know, the you're taught a woman has a role, men have a role, and you follow these roles that are given to you. You know, a woman's job is to be at home. She's a caregiver. The man's job is to go out and be the breadwinner. You know, all these standard, you know, really conservative values. Well, and it doesn't matter the woman's decision the man has the final say regardless of the situation yeah and 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 i don't know if i ever felt you know i'm just not that kind of person to where it was like oh no we're having sex here or you know or else you know it was never we never had that kind of relationship but i i remember telling danielle early on i can forgive you for anything but ever being with another person in any way. If you ever are with another person in any other way, or if I'm ever with another person in another way, you need to leave me, hold me to the same standards. Because I'm, I said, if you ever do anything, I'm divorcing you. I'm gone. It doesn't matter what it is. And because her sexuality, just to me, to share that with somebody else would have just seemed like the most awful thing in the world, you know? And so, yeah. So I kind of felt like, no, I get her. She's mine. She's, she can't be shared. She can't, you know? Um, and so it's, yeah, it it was definitely this, you know, without, like I said, without abuse or anything, this dominance that I felt like I, you know, I had, you know, well, with that regards, I, almost stopped talking to men in general. I rarely talked to another man unless another woman was present because every time I would talk to a man, I'd be accused of flirting with them. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, I was just talking to them. I mean, I'm the 10th girl. Like I grew up learning to flirt. <laughs> yeah. That's just how I talk. So, so did those, so, yes, those tendencies, did they manifest themselves in, in jealousy or anything when you started exploring with other couples or with other people? Definitely. Um, and so we, we ended up having a few more, you know, positive experiences after that one, you know, and I really, after, after one of them, I just had a hard time sleeping and I, you know, we were fighting a lot and we just, really couldn't figure out I couldn't figure out what was going on with me what was wrong with me I knew it had to do with what we did with other couples but I didn't really know why because logically I was like all that was fun it was fine nobody got hurt we did it with all very safe people we you know together yeah together consensually everything we wanted everything every rule and guideline and everything that you talk for way too long about <laughs> um, mm-hmm. was, was all met. And, and I was still having these problems. And, you know, I went in, I finally went to a therapist and he said, Hey, look, you, you got to realize you still have all those same core values. There's still a part of you that carries that, you know, Danielle's sexuality belongs to you, that sex that doing what you're doing is a really awful thing. He says, it might not really 
be in your kind of what he called intermediate thoughts, your rational thoughts. He says, but it's, it was so buried deep down inside of you that it's really manifesting itself. And I was like, holy cow, I think you're right. You know? And so he said, Hey, step back. And if you want to continue in the lifestyle, which he didn't say stop, which surprised me because he was a very conservative (laughs) uh, guy, but, but he was like, if you want to continue, you need to realize that this process for you is going to be slower than it is for a lot of people. You have to have small positive experiences. And then when you have things come up, you have to really rationalize, not rationalize, but have to realize in your head, Hey, why am I having this feeling? Why am I having this thought? Why is this jealousy here? Why am I having an anxiety here? And is it, because of an old belief? Is it because of a jealousy? And really kind of take the time to realize that it's fine to have those feelings and then just to kind of set them aside and not chase them, not, you know, give them more power than they need to have over you, but that it's to realize why you're having them and that it's okay to have them. And, and since then, you know, we, kind of stepped back a little bit and everything has gone really well. Um, You know, we've really just started to kind of focus on each other, but still explore as much of the shadows of our sexuality as we can. So since you started talking with therapists and everything, you've you've dialed back uh, anything with other people. Is that correct? Yeah. So that was kind of, that, that was kind of the main thing. And he didn't say, you know, don't do that. But that was just kind of our choice was, yeah. a let's, you know, there's no rush on this. We're still young. You know, there's plenty of time. And so, yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now is uh, just kind of stepping back from that and then having fun in a lot of other other things that we've never done. So, yeah. <laughs> And Danielle, did you have any issues with jealousy at all? Have you? Um, my jealousy's been, like, I think, the typical ones everyone has. Like, oh, what if he likes, you know, the girl he's with? What if she, you know, does something better? Or what if she's prettier? Um, those type of jealousies. But I didn't have a, as much as a problem with Clayton. Um, mm-hmm. I have found... Um, for me in, in my journey, I feel like I've become more of an empowered. I've, I've learned how to accept myself and my body more, but also at the same time, um, adhering to Clayton's anxieties that he was having. Um, for example, when we went to Burning Man last year there, it's very pro nudity and Mm -hmm. I wanted to walk around nude. And at one point, you know, Clayton said, Hey, I'm, I'm having a hard time with this. You know, so I put, you know, some extra layers of clothes on and that was fine. And then in Iceland, we got in the hot pots every time nude, <laughs> you know, so in that year, like he had been able to work on things and be comfortable and have all those positives that we were able to progress um, up to my level of being comfortable around nudity. Um, now, for me being nude, it isn't necessarily a sexual thing for me. It's like I said, it's owning my my own body. It's acceptance. It's empowering. Yeah, and is that That's something kind of that? It. Yeah, it's fascinating. And it is. I wanted to ask you about the body confidence, both of you. Has that something that you've grown into as you've gotten older yeah. and experienced more, or is that something that you felt you you've just naturally had? I think Danielle has been by far more the nudist than me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, I, I'm okay with it and I, you know, I'll walk around, but you know, I'm probably going to be the one going and looking for my bottoms a lot sooner than her. And I, I don't know necessarily why that is, but she's just never really, I don't think she's ever really equated that to any sort of sex or anything to where it's, I mean, it really is just like, woo, you know, like I'm naked and having fun. And that's as deep as it goes for her. Yeah. Um, for me, it's it's kind of been a little bit more. Um, I, I, I do want to circle back to um, what Finn was kind of talking or you were talking about with the, the jealousies. And so 
I think one of the issues I also had with, you know, kind of starting out was Danielle was the tentative one. So I was kind of the one that was walking down the path saying, we should find naked friends. She's like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, look at this YouTube video. This is awesome. And she's like, okay, <laughs> that does the fun. And so, and then, you know, I was like, you know, we never did anything with anybody else really, you know, like I, I've never really got to play with other girls' boobs. We got married young. Like I want to have a few of these experiences. And so we, I kind of led her down that path. And then when we got to that point, she was like, Oh, this is awesome. We should do this. You know? Like, <laughs> so all of a sudden, you know, now I feel like she's kind of pulling on me and I was, I don't think I was ready for that initially. Mm -hmm for her to just embrace it. And then I think that's really kind of when I had to step back and go, wait, okay. She's her own sexual person. You know, I, I don't get to control the narrative on this. This is, this is, it, it's time for me to kind of cut out these, um, me trying to control situations or me kind of leading, you know, she's got her, she's got a voice. She's her own person. And, and, and I, so it was really good for me to kind of watch her embrace non-monogamy because it not only, because I got to kind of watch her empower herself, if that makes sense, even yeah. though it scared the hell out of me uh, for a little bit because <laughs> I didn't know how to deal with that. It was new to me, but it was really good for me. Like, I, I love it. And now, you know, I look at it and when we have talks, it's, you know, it's, we're both our own people with our own opinions and, and I don't know, it, it's, yeah, it, it, that, that part of non-monogamy has actually been really healthy for our relationship. Yeah. And I think that's amazing too. And, and I, and I guess maybe on, on Danielle's side, had, was that something that was a big struggle for you? I mean, it, you know, growing up, it sounds like you were taught to basically defer to men and defer basically all of your agency to somebody else to then all of a sudden be in these situations and need to be able to be empowered to say yes when you want to say yes, say no when you want to say no, and and be confident enough to do those things. Was that something that you struggled with with doing? Yes, it was. When I in my early years, my youth, um, I I was kind of a spunky kid, I guess, and I didn't have that much problems, but when um, when I started in my dating years and when we got married, it was, you know, the switch was flipped and it was, no, you have to adhere to your, you know, to your husband. He's a patriarch. And it went as far as, um, if I wanted to go to a restaurant with my friends or something, I would call Clayton at work and be like, is it okay if, you know, we go to this restaurant with my friends and I would feel guilty spending, you know, $5 or a dollar, like every little thing I felt like I had to be held accountable to in Clayton's defense. It drove him insane. <laughs> he hated it. But that was just the mentality and how I was raised. And so to, take control of myself, of my body, of, you know, my spirituality, of my sexuality really empowered me to, to become it almost back to those, you know, carefree days as a child. And I always, Clayton always jokes around that now I'm back to high school, Danielle, mm -hmm. <laughs> to when he, you know, first fell in love with me. No, and I think that's, I think that's fascinating that it, that having those discussions around non-monogamy gave you that agency to take back control and, and bring you back. And imagine on, on Clayton's side that, you know, that was something that then sort of probably drew you even closer to her because that it sounds like was something that you were hoping she had all along. I mean, yeah, not wanting no, to have to give her permission to go to a restaurant is, you know, a good example yeah. of that. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, well, and now I feel like we wrote this article about my hot tub and for my hot tub, it's a, a very safe place. And I like to get in into the hot tub and I'm normally, you know, bottoms on, but topless. And I kind of gauge the other friends we are with, um, you know, if topless is going to be okay. And um, I have this one particular friend 
And the first time she met Clayton and I, she, you know, went home to her husband and she, she just told him, I don't think I like them. They talk about sex way too much. (laughs) Six months later, you know, we're having, we're having them over for, you know, a hot tub and drinks and we're already sitting in the hot tub and she walks out and we were in swimming suits. Yeah. And we were all wearing our swimming suits and she drops her pants and is topless and gets in completely nude. <laughs> wow. And this was in her husband didn't know about. So her husband's like, whoa, whoa, like this is like the most conservative girl, like of our friends. And all of a sudden she's the one who's naked getting into our hot tub. And we're like, Holy cow. And after that, she's like, that was the day I got, I gained my own sexuality, you know, and she has just become this whole new person. And so it's been really fun to kind of watch some of these people. And so we've had a couple friends like that. We've that, had a few moments like that where I get to experience someone's, you know, transformation of coming into their own selves, being empowered and, and reclaiming their sexuality. Yeah. Yeah. We had one group of friends that we had met and they were new friends. We'd only known them for a month or two through some other friends. And it was kind of that same thing. We got into the hot tub, everybody's in swimsuits. And then Danielle was like, can I take my top off? And she's like, okay. And then pretty soon she's got her top off and then pretty soon everybody's naked. And we've been able to watch these friends and that was their first experience. And now they've had non-monogamous experiences that they've loved. And it's been just, it's just been crazy watching like, you know, like people are like, how do you get naked friends? Or like, well, now just we're just open. Like, you, just, <laughs> you buy a hot tub. That's yeah. The, that's, yeah. The that's the key. <laughs> buy a hot tub. But it, 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 it's funny that a lot of times if you provide somebody a safe enough space, you know, to allow themselves to kind of open up, you really can see you know, with your friends, you know, this non-judgmental safe space, you know, you can see them kind of just really open themselves up. And that's, that's been kind of fun through this whole process is to kind of be with some of our friends going through the process too. Right. Yeah. And so, I mean, well, going into the, the experiences you've had in non-monogamy, you know, a lot of times we'll talk to people and they have tons and tons and tons of conversations about, what they're going to do, what are the rules, what can't they do. And and these conversations maybe go on for months or a year even before they ever do anything. Did did the two of you have those conversations and that build up about here's what, you know, maybe tonight we're going to have some friends over. I'm okay going to this point, but not further. Or was it sort of just see what happens in the moment? So I, I'm an overthinker. So we've ended up now having the conversation of let's not have these conversations anymore. (laughs) (laughs) So, so we definitely had everything kind of laid out and it took a long time of having those conversations. You know, for me, I think mainly I needed to have those conversations more than once just to really learn how to give Danielle the trust that I needed to give to her. And now that I've got that level of trust and we've kind of talked about it, we don't feel like we need to talk about every situation. You know, we've kind of talked, Oh, if you're in this situation, let's do this. If we're in this situation, let's do this. Would you do that in this situation? You know, and, and kind of laid it out so much that it's almost made it not fun. Right. Yeah. 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 To where it's like, well, you know, uh, for example, in Paris, we went into a sex club, um, and this was just a month ago or so, and we had talked, well, what if this happens, you know, what if somebody tries to kiss you, what if somebody, t-? And, and we created all these scenarios, and we got in, and none of them happened. <laughs> and, and then we laughed, and we're like, we had like nine hours of conversations to build up for this one hour in this club, and none of them came to pass, you know, and so I think, I think that you have to be sometimes kind of talk about it, you know, is really important, but also kind of realize don't, 
don't go too crazy about it. If that makes sense. Like you, right. you, you try to predict what's going to happen and you can't. And, and I think the biggest thing is to say, Hey, these are the things I'm comfortable with for sure. And then from there, I have trust in you to make the right decisions. Yeah. Um, yep. don't, we don't have to talk about every scenario. Definitely. We put what red, yellow, and green lights on things. These are our green lights and these are our yellow lights that, you know, come talk to me if we're in that situation. And, and then our red lights are obviously, a, you know, you don't cross that boundary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But of course, none of those ever happen. <laughs> right. Yeah. I was curious, what was your impression of a Paris sex club? So this, this, was, this was the very first sex club you've ever been to in anywhere, correct? Yes and no. So we no. had we had a really positive experience in Burning Man. So we oh. we finally convinced ourselves to go into the orgy dome that they yeah. have uh-huh. there. It was amazing. I mean, we got in, things worked, which is always important. I put on a show and and, I really found I liked that. (laughs) And we were standing in line with all these people for, you know, 45 minutes. And you're like, we're going to have sex next to these people. This is insane. And, And then we went in and we undressed in front of everybody and put our clothes in a bucket and then went into this giant room. And there was, you know, probably... 50 couples in there all oh, going at it. Different and, types of couples. And so we went in and we found a spot and we had this amazing time with each other. Um, the tent has two sides, a non-touching side. Well, they call it a non-consent side and a consent side. So the non-consent side, you, you're you not even, you can't ask. If you go to that side, it's just stay with your partner and don't ask the other side, you give people permission to ask consent, and then you can say yes or no. Uh-huh. So okay. they kind of split it up that way, and we thought, you know, we're not ready for the consent side. I don't really, I don't know if I want to have people coming up and talking to us, so let's just stay on the other side. And anyway, we, we end up having this amazing experience, which is why we thought, well, maybe a club would be as fun. Um yeah. <laughs> so. Spoiler alert. Our friends now joke around and have a saying, is it balls on legs fun? <laughs> so, yeah. So what? So we ended up going in, and, uh, and there weren't a whole lot of people there. There were a few couples. We didn't connect with anybody, so we thought, well, let's just go upstairs. And we went upstairs, and we had about five or six single guys follow us up. <laughs> and, and, you know, we're going, you know, starting to kind of warm up and we're getting ready. And, you know, I look over and there's like five guys jerking off like five feet from us. And we're like, okay, this is, uh, this is having a hard time. And one of them, you know, he kept coming up and he would grab, uh, Danielle's breast and we're like, eh, you know, Hey, you go back, you know, and it was more just the fact that it was throwing us off. He wasn't asking permission. Yeah. And, and so we went into this other room and we're like, okay, let's just leave this room. And so we went into this other room and we kind of found this, there was this back corner and there were these bars. And on the other side of these bars was a foursome going on. And we're like, well, this is cool. Cause we can be next to this foursome, but there's these gel bars, you know, they can't touch us. <laughs> and, and so there's this divider and I'm like, this is kind of hot. This will be fun. And so Danielle sits on me. And I'm like, that's got to be a set of balls on my leg. <laughs> There's no way that's not balls on my leg. And this guy had mounted one of my legs. He's got his balls sitting on my knee. And he goes <laughs> in and he just grabs Danielle's ass and tries to go touch her vagina. And we're like, whoa. whoa oh, I, can't, I was so pissed. <laughs> we're like, come on. What do we got to do? And. So finally, we get his balls removed from my leg, <laughs> and we're like, we got to have sex. I mean, yeah, we haven't had penetration at yeah, this point. Yeah, we're, we're so thrown off, and the lights come on, and they're like, you need to leave. Clubs closed. The clubs closed, <laughs> and we're like, oh, are you serious? And so we packed up, and 
off we went. So, oh man, that's a long way to go for that. Uh, didn't get to have sex in the sex club. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so we're still waiting for that experience. But I, I it, it honestly, I think what we learned is if we left and we went, you know, um, you really can't always be nice. Sometimes you just have to be really vocal, really strong. Yeah. Be like, no, you got to leave, you know, and, and we're, we're Which nice. we did ask them a few times to leave. Yeah, but we're just too <laughs> nice of people, I think, and, you know, and we're like, okay, if we're in these scenarios again, it's just we got to be more vocal is kind yeah. of what we got for that. Um, so in a way, it wasn't a terrible experience. We got a funny story mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and we went for it. It's not always going to be this awesome thing but we laugh about it now so much that i don't know if that story is better than a sexy story or yeah so sometimes the most awkward stories or uncomfortable ones turn into be the best the best ones to tell people later on so yeah we've definitely got our share of those yeah like, your share balls on legs yeah or worse balls on legs you don't have balls on legs i said or worse <laughs> <laughs> so I had I had a, maybe a two part question, and um, then I guess we can probably start wrapping things up. Yeah. But, so you mentioned that after talking to the therapist, you guys kind of dialed back and started focusing more on yourselves. But then you also said that you you've been having fun exploring new things together. And then earlier on, you mentioned that you had sex for four hundred days straight. So. There's part of me that's saying, what what was left to explore within yourselves that you hadn't explored, and and maybe, if you don't mind talking about that, like what are the new things that you've you've opened up to since your marathon? Well, the the 400 days it was just um, between Clayton and I. No one else was involved. That wasn't even a thought at that point, and it was, you know, just okay, I like you, just the normal things, like I like it in this position. Oh, wow, I really like having public, you know, sex in nature. And the I find I really enjoy the chance of getting caught. Like I really enjoy sex where there's that little chance. We're usually, I mean, 99% of the chance we're never going to get caught. <laughs> yeah. But that 1% chance that, you know, hey, someone might turn that corner or, you know, Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I also found that I really enjoy being nude in um, public and that, um, yeah, just those things. I also found that things that I was too afraid to try or I thought were too taboo that, you know, it's okay to try them. It's a, it might not be my favorite thing every time, but, you know, like example, anal sex, it's not something we do all the time, but, you know, it's, it's fun and and masturbation's fun and watching a porn together, those type of things we just never crossed my mind before the four hundred day marathon. Yeah. And as far as things after that four hundred days goes, you know, it's there's still just so much that you can do as a you know, as a partner, you know, without kind of stepping in with other people. Um we uh, went to what's called a local, it's called element 11. It's a local burning man event and they had tantra classes and, you know, we just learned about orgasmic breathing. Um, they had a, a kind of a place where a safe place where you could have sex in front of other people if you wanted, you know? So, and, and then that sex club, you know, that was a really big, that was a really big thing for us. You know, that was, like, holy cow, let's, we're in Paris. Do you, you want to go? And kind of researching it, you know, we've talked about the desire that you, you know, mentioned a lot in your, your podcast. That's kind of still a bucket list item. So kind of a lot of those different types of things. And maybe that led into my next question, which was going to be, you've, you've finished your first bucket list. What have you, have you developed a new one and and maybe what are some of the things on your new bucket list that have yet to be accomplished? Maybe, maybe a top one from each side from one from Danielle, one from Clayton. Oh man, we need to, 
If they pay the list. Uh, we, need, update it. <laughs> we need an updated bucket list. I wish I had the old one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think since we we did dabble our toes into, you know, the lifestyle a little bit, I think for me, I don't necessarily want to have sex with another person. The idea intrigues me because I've only been with Clayton and I understand like everyone's different and you, know, you can learn so much, but I found I'm not a big fantasy person, but I'm finding thinking about that is the fantasy is better for me than the actual situation. Um, and I say that, for example, in Paris, I was like, I want to kiss a French guy because I've heard, you know, all the hype about kissing, a, you know, a real French guy. And then when it came down to it, all the emotions behind it and my, you know, self-proclaimed germaphobe came up and worry about, you know, all these STIs and I couldn't do it. But the fantasy was super hot. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I don't know if it's a bucket list as much as, you know, kind of appealing to me more, but as, as a kind of given Danielle, her not given God, what a big thing to say, uh, <laughs> but, um, kind of, uh, you know, as, as she's kind of developed her own to becoming her own sexual person away from me in a positive way, not like with other people, but as we kind of talked, becoming your own sexual person, you know, the, the idea of going, Hey, it might be kind of fun to watch her explore that further. I, I, I don't know exactly where that would go or where that would lead. Um, but you know, that's, that's kind of a new thing that could go onto a bucket list is, um, you know, watching her kind of explore that further. With like with another guy having having sex with another guy. Yeah, and, and and even if it wasn't up to sex, you know, just you know, anything else. It, it, yeah. Soft swapping here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So, right. Being intimate in general. But it is funny that um, we've kind of talked, and it's like we still put this value on sex that we always did and i think that's why we still struggle with it is because just that core value system that we grew up with it just seems like the most monumental crazy thing to have sex with another person like um <laughs> We've only been with each other yeah, yeah. so so i right. think that that kind of still falls under that whole thing like okay let's kind of cruise this really slow if we're going to cruise it and and kind of get there because, you know, I think, you know, just for being who we are, you know, we just have to kind of go slow with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. I mean, I'm the same way. I don't, I don't do it myself. Emma does it all yeah. the time. So yeah. I could never, <laughs> I could never bring myself to do that. Yeah. Well, logically, <laughs> honestly, logically, it makes so much sense to us. <laughs> like, like everything about us is just like, who the fuck cares? Like you just go do this, you know? And then there's the other sides of us that we kind of battle with. And it yeah. just, and I, but, but it's, you know, we, it's us and that, and we're not going to fight that, you know, and kind of force ourselves into situations we're not ready to. Yeah. And, and I, think, I think that you makes know, that's, a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's kind of one of the reasons too, with the blog that we wanted to talk about that is because, you know, there's going to be a lot of other people in our situation. And maybe you have a fantasy of having sex with somebody else, but that's probably not going to be off the table with how you were brought up. Maybe some of those same things, but you can still get, you know, you can still get naked. You can with other people. You can, st there's still a million ways to explore your sexuality with your, your spouse. You know? Yeah. And that's where we kind of call that monogamish way. So for us, you know, it, that's the monogamous shit. Hey, you're married. Okay. Well, here's, here's the group. Here's the list of rules that you now get to follow. And couples don't pick those. They're handed those, you know, yeah. and, and couples should be able to pick the list of things they want to have in their marriage. You know, they should be able to take that list of these are the do's and don'ts for sex in your marriage 
that should be an agreement. You know, it should be sitting down and going, okay, what do you want on the list? What do you not want on the list? You know, and let's do this together. And, you know, it's just too bad that so many people are just held in their minds to a set of rules that they were given and never agreed to in a way. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, it, it is. And those, and it has a lot of power over people. So, you know, the, it, the power that it doesn't need to have. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. I think to wrap things up, uh, we thank you guys for spending a little while talking to us, but um, I was curious, you know, you've mentioned that you have naked friends and I know you both have both large families. Are you out to anyone in your families or your other friends from before, or is this all been kept under wraps? So as far as our friends go, we have most of the friends that we actually hang out with do know, you know, we have some more kind of acquaintance type of friends that don't know family is a few know we have a blog but they don't necessarily know what it's about and they know not to look at it <laughs> <laughs> yeah so and, and the thing that's funny about the blog is there's really not much there in, in a sense of what should be that scandalous um i mean you're gonna see our ash cheeks you know you're gonna see yeah some censored things and, and, and we're going to talk about sex, you know, and, and for still some reason it's, it's hard to let everybody know about that. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's just the human nature part of it, but most of our friends do know. And some of our family probably has a pretty good inkling. <laughs> yeah. I think the hardest part with that is when you share something like that with people, they automatically know a whole bunch about you and you may not know that much about them. So it's kind of a vulnerable topic sometimes, I think, to you. I don't know. You just you're sharing a lot with people that you have put out there publicly, but um, yeah, they may not know it to yeah. you. Well, and it's easy to share with strangers. It's a lot yeah. harder to with friends and family. Um, exactly. And like you said, uh, you know, as far as titles go, you know, we we had a title our whole lives. We were Mormon, and then we weren't. And then we went on a search, and what we kind of came out with because we're like, well, let's try this religion. Well, maybe we're this, and let's let's do this. And then at the end, we're like, we're not a title. And kind of with our sexuality, you know, I think when people give it titles, and I think why people hate the title swingers so much is there's certain titles that when given to somebody, most people define them a hundred percent as that. Yeah. Whereas, you know, and, and that's, and that's hard with our blog because, you know, we don't want people to be like, Oh, they're just this. And it's like, well, I mean, 95% of our life is just the daily grudge, you know, like, but we take that 5%, and just have fun with it as much fun with it as we can, you know, and, but it's, it's hard, you know, people use titles just so much. And then once that you're titled with one thing, that's just what you are. And I think, right. you know, that's why we, we just try to avoid that. Yeah, for sure. And so, so anybody who hasn't been to your blog and, and what they're going to find, I think is a lot of, and, and maybe be better for you to say, but it's travel pictures. It's pictures of you guys going on adventures. It's bits about you guys talking about sex and relationships. So it's a little bit of everything. Is that that's correct? Yeah, yeah. We kind of wanted it to just be a snapshot of our lives. There's pe travel sites that are going to be way better than ours, you know, <laughs> and there's, you know, and, and so we we were like, well, we want to document our travels and stuff, but you know, people people are really good at this and do it full time, and it's like this, it, it really isn't what we want. You know, it, it, we couldn't see a value in doing that, but what we saw a value in was was kind of going, okay, well, maybe let's give a vulnerable snapshot of our relationship, of our ups and downs of, you know, what we do to keep it exciting. And then that's really kind of where, you know, it was like, okay, well, this is more about fighting boring marriages than anything. 
and an important part of that is sex for mm-hmm. us. So we're going to talk about it. Yeah. And, and yeah, and uh, it, it's something that needs to be talked about more. Obviously, yeah, no, you've got to see. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 100%. absolutely. And I guess I think maybe just a, a final word is I think we wanted to say thank you both for coming on the show, but also for creating that as a resource. And I think, you know, we've spent some time over there looking and it's, it's awesome seeing people out doing the things you're doing. And, and it's a lot of the things that we love doing. It's hiking, it's camping, it's exploring nature. And then at the same time, you're half naked or you're doing, I mean, it's just, it's such a cool mix of awesome things that I, I just, we wanted to say thanks for coming on and thanks for, for sharing everything with, uh, with the world. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. That was, it's amazing. And we're so glad to virtually meet you guys. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us. Absolutely. Wow. Well, well, well. Welcome back to us. Now that we're all equipped to fight boring marriages, uh, the best place... Actually, this was something we were supposed to mention at the intro, but now we're in the outro. <laughs> they, uh, Oops. they are retooling their block. So if you were like, oh, damn, I got to go check that out, and you went there and it was empty... It won't be early next year. They are working on what they're, you know, they're going to kind of relaunch it in the beginning of the year. We talked to them just the other day. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, if you want to see amazing photos and all the amazing stuff they do, they're still very active on the Instagram. Yes. So go check them out on Instagram and links to that will be in the show notes as well. Exactly. And thanks to them. We had an awesome time talking to them and thanks for sharing their story. Yes. Next week, we we have we've got we've got one of the more emotional interviews we've ever done. It's pretty. It's a pretty awesome, incredible interview from. It's uh, more raw and personal than I mean. All of them are pretty personal. I was gonna say. I was like, yeah, but it is. It's more emotional than some of the other ones. It's a young woman from. Well, she's from South America, but she lives in Barcelona and. She tells us basically her incredible journey about where she started and where she is now and sort of the struggle she's going through with her and her wife. Mm -hmm. So please come back in a week, listen to that. In the meantime, uh, you can just go listen to all our other episodes. I think you have enough time (laughs) to do that as well. So yeah. Enjoy your... Especially because by now, Normalized Non-Monogamy is your homepage. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I forgot it was your homepage. (laughs) Yeah, so go listen, and we will see everybody in T-minus one week. Yeah, and just a quick reminder, you can find us on Twitter and Cassian with the screen name NNM Podcast. Please reach out to us. We love to hear from all of you. That's it. Okay. Bye, Bye -bye. everyone. Bye now.